we don't even see a lot of this in our own lives. I didn't for years. It's a constant roller coaster and recommittal process. Hey, you guys, how you doing? This is another episode of Unrefined Podcast. This is Brandon here today, and I have a very uh, good friend of mine and a great guest that comes on our show often. His name is Tim Holloway. Tim, how you doing? I'm doing good, brother. Thanks again for having me back on the show, man. Yeah, I mean, he, he and I do a band of brothers together, and we have some other vested interests out there, some things that we do. Uh, just check with us if you're ever interested in them. But today we want to talk about something that's really, it's, it's on both our hearts. And I, I wanted to talk to him about it because he's actually in the process of writing a book about it and he's doing a course about it. And it's just something that's really pervading the, the body of Christ right now with different groups, different, particularly cultic groups, but even in Christian circles. And it's a reaction to a lot of the grace teaching out there, which has its own ditches and problems and stuff. Sure. Yeah. But we want to talk about legalism today, and so I'll let Tim get us started, and we can have a conversation about legalism. Absolutely. Matt, I just dive into um, my experience, and I, and I really didn't know that I was jumping into legalism. I mean, you get saved how you get saved, and, and yeah. God reaches you with whatever you know, means he, he reaches you with. But I stumbled into a Pentecostal church um, that was holiness based. Yeah, it was called a revival center. We had uh, a lot of Pentecostal stuff going around and, and, and revivals and stuff. But uh, needless to say, it was it was attached to more of a holiness frame of mind. And uh, within that system, you know, I learned how everybody else in Christianity was wrong, and those poor church down the street who are not you know spirit filled and it didn't take long for like elitism and pride to capture a hold of me so even though you know i'd had a genuine experience with god right just being in the frame of of holiness and superior uh kind of mindset it didn't take long for me to kind of adopt some of those ways well look you know i went to a holiness seminary and what I noticed, uh, even amongst that movement, is some people tend to go towards legalism, but then sure. some don't. Some don't. Some actually get the, the the idea that grace empowers the heart, and we walk out the Word of God because of that grace. So why do you think that's yeah. so? You know, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Some uh, do this and some don't. I think I can give the identification to the ones that do, and that is... They, they make it very performance-based in the sense of, like, no no sin will enter heaven, right? That's, yeah. that's a common thing. And we understand that that no sin will enter heaven in the sense of we're going to be mature and, and complete and, and that sort of frame. That's not the frame that they're delivering. The frame is, right. is if you got sin in your life right now, you will not make it. So that's one of a, a certain key indicators in what often goes with that is it's a constant roller coaster and recommittal process. Mm-hmm. And what I found for me was when I'd fall into sin, uh, therefore I was I was no longer worthy. I would skip communion. I would um, I would be scared of the fact that I, now that I wasn't going to to enter heaven. So I would say. Holiness. Uh, the differentiator is is you know standing in power and having holiness a byproduct of of the love of God and or the other side where you feel like um, you f- you f- you're attached to the sinner complex and your behavior is the key to whether you're in or out at any given moments. <laughs> oh yeah 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 yeah. I mean and and, and- Two of the things that, that I see it, in my experience with, with that, I mean, the, the seminary I went to was mostly Methodist, but it was a, a branch of the Methodist holiness type. It, it promoted the, the second act of grace, the entire sanctification, and all that kind of stuff. What I noticed, though, is the, the definition of sin had to drastically change for you to live a holy lifestyle. And what I noticed 
in some like reform circles, sin is like so it's so powerful that we can't even like sneeze without committing a sin, you know? And because yeah. we're just depraved, dead, morally worms, worm theology is what I call it. But then in, in this group that I grew up or, or went to seminary and, and kind of grew up in, it, it was more, um, they had to simplify sin because you had to li- live some form of holiness. And if you really had the standard that the reform guys did, you really couldn't keep up with it. So you were in constant sin. So therefore you didn't go to heaven. So I really find that an ironic thing of, of a redefinition of what sin is. And sure. Uh, and, and that's what really helped me come out of a lot of legalism is I've stopped seeing sin as more about the acts of sins and started seeing sin as a, a almost a entity in my life that needed to be dealt with. If that makes any sense. That's very interesting. I, uh, yeah, I would concur with that because, you know, uh, the story of Cain and, and God telling him that, that sin is crouched at the door and it ha- its desire is for you. Yes. So it's literally a personification uh, of sin and, and it has a desire. So I would, uh, I would totally agree with that statement. The, the reform concept of, of total uh, depravity um, in the way it's defined I would think would lead to um, the other side, maybe maybe even more of the slippery slope of grace, because you know having the and I don't I don't think it was meant to be. I get total depravity inside of salvation, um, in but I don't understand it the way they do. I understand it more as like a insecure, fear based, sinful nature. Yeah, um, I don't consider it as a, a like man is totally deprived of, of, of the ability to do anything good or anything like that. But I call it moral depravity is, is, is my, you know, sure. That's, that's kind of a, that's a balanced way because there's other theologians that say, Hey, we aren't deprived at all. We're not born in sin. You know, Pelagianism, I don't go that far, but yeah, I don't, I don't like the word total. That that's the, you yeah. know, that's, it's a real absoluteness to that terminology. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes the nature and makes it something that it's not, but so taking that concept of total depravity and then still having the, the feeling that you're totally depraved, <laughs> I feel like legalism does that, uh, in the sense that you could never really measure up to the standard. You're constantly in guilt and condemnation. So it reconfirms that you're, you're this total depravity, uh, sort of model. So you can go into legalism with that total depravity yeah. or you can go yeah. to the other side of like, Hey, look, I'm a sinner. Uh, and I'm totally depraved, so um, I could just, you know, uh, thank goodness for his grace, and I could just like, mm-hmm. and yep. sadly, like, when you talk about the reform, they tend to lean on um, that they absolutely sin, like, all the time, and they're too connected to the to the depravity where there doesn't seem to be much freedom, so that's my... Well, like Dallas Willard calls it, you know, one of my favorite philosophers, he calls it sin consciousness. That's there you go. Bo- both sides deal with sin consciousness. I mean, I, I actually mentor a, a guy who comes out of the holiness tradition, a young guy. And, and, and I had to really pull him out of this whole, he was always worried about not sinning. And I'm like, the Christian life is not worried about you not sinning all the time. That's not what holiness is. It, <laughs> It, it has a positive aspect to it, but not just a negative yeah. aspect to it. Uh, yeah. So, I remember a, a guy that I was mentoring uh, uh, after I got saved, and um, so basically our conversations, like, "Hey, is that a sin? Is this a sin? Is that a sin?" I got I got really tired after a while. I said, "Look, everything's a sin." <laughs> <laughs> That's great <laughs> because it's like. You know, under the uh, the guise of religiosity, like yeah, there's yeah. just there's no escaping it. Define that term for our audience. What do you mean by the word religiosity? Because you know, some people use the word religion, and it's not pejorative like you and I do. Can you kind of yeah. define what religiosity is to you? Yeah, yeah, I would like to define it together because I know that you you have the, a working definition of religion, but uh, meaning to bind fast. Um, so. Religion in general means to bind fast. So on the positive side, let's because let's admit there's yeah. positive sides to 
to religion. To bind fast would signify something that you hold on to very tightly. Mm. Uh, it would signify something that you you hold on to as a routine. Uh, you bind fast to a routine, and then yeah. I also have with it the mindsets and belief systems of the teachings that you hold fast to. Okay. So it, it kind of has a good. So let's go on the the negative side of religion and religiosity. Right, would be the same definition. So I received some sort of uh, teaching that I'm binding fast to. I've never challenged it. It was passed down from my family. This is the culture and the religion that, that, that I grew up in. And so I have religion. I'm binding fast to that. And all of my mindset, perspective, and paradigms come from that thing. So when God begins to woo me via dreams, via um, different things that happen inside of my life, uh, experiences, I'm incapable of being wooed because of the thing that I'm binding fast to. I'm unwilling to let that go. So um, yeah. And then, you know, what do you think of what do you think of bind? Like go into uh, some of your thoughts on that because I'm interested too. Yeah, it has a Latin framework for it. And, it, and it, you're right, it means to bind again or to bind to. And uh, in, in my viewpoint, it can be detrimental. It can be like... Uh, Captivity, it can be you're bound to some, something that, that is other than God, you know, because we have to be careful, like with words like tradition. I mean, I, we were watching a, a show last night and this guy was talking about tradition, and tradition is a good thing if you have it, but if the tradition has you, it's not a good thing. And, and that's, that's what I see religion a lot of times is religiosity and that stuff is when these acts that we commit in piety or pious acts that we commit towards God, they tend to come back on us and they have us more than we have them. And yeah. uh, it, it leads, honestly, to if you go down a spectrum, it leads to more occultism and, and magic because they are the ultimate legalist and the ultimate uh, religiosity because everything they do somehow pushes a button to manipulate whatever deity or whatever whatever yeah. power that they're they're trying to do and once we get over into that aspect of i can manipulate god or i can manipulate a deity or something like that you've got into religiosity and well, uh that, yeah, they're, so, they're. yeah and 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 in the manipulation it can be subtle it can be super 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 duper subtle you know it doesn't have to be uh, anything major. What what I tend to think, and I see in Jesus's life, and I wanted to bring this out while you're talking about it, is I think a lot of the religious people that he was up against, they created these these little rules all around, like the the ones that really counted, and they would keep all these little rules. And if you keep all these little rules to the world, you look holy. But yeah, but but when you you don't really do the ones that really count, the ones that really matter. The ones that matter, yeah. A, a, example, you know, you keep your hair long, you don't wear makeup. Um, you know, what's some more? You read your Bible every day. You share the gospel to the point where you won't go to sleep at night. You'll run out and go share the gospel with somebody, or, or you know, any you, you smoke, you drink, you, you chew, you go with those that do. I mean, uh, that's that classic. Won't cuss and chew. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So I don't do those things, but I don't take care of my parents like I should or the way God wants me to. You know, Jesus pointed this out constantly to the Pharisees. He called it straightening out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And I yeah. think that is the key to religiosity because it's all about appearance. You want to look like you're holy to everybody else when inside you're really a whitewashed tomb. Yeah. That's good. That, well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, with the Pharisees, if if you want to discover what legalism looked like, um, all you have to do is 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 read about the Pharisees. There's one chapter, I believe it's in Matthew, that he, he commits the whole chapter to uh, rebuking some of their uh, the behaviors and stuff that's going on. So it's like religiosity 101 is right here. Um, you know, inside of my family and the holiness, uh, I probably gravitated towards that because. You know, my, my grandmother was, uh, was that way. 
And, um, you know, she wasn't allowed to go to the movies. Uh, she wasn't allowed to go to dances, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things, even the circuses, um, the circuses were of the devil. Mm -hmm. Um, all of these things were, were, were considered, uh, satanic and stuff. So, but I, what I wanted to, um, talk about is the practical definition of religion and that's right. more of like yeah. a system that uh that uh, uh we try to appease god or or find ba basically the benefits of our salvation we endeavor through that list of rules to try to get that uh on a performance based thing so it all comes back to uh, appeasement and trying to trying to get something from God, just like you said, trying to to manipulate Him to give Him uh, us the benefits of our salvation instead of accepting those by a free gift, and that's what I find the one of the biggest problems is it leaves us not experiencing those realities. Yeah, well, it's just like if 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 uh, I feel like that I have to constantly. I mean, we we experience this in natural life. If I feel like I have to constantly appease my parents and live up to their expectations to get their approval, I mean, that's an awful thing. People go through that. We all have been through it in different areas and different things. That that is what God is trying to remove from our life with grace. You know, yeah. With with grace, we don't. We no longer have to have the performance orientation. To please him, he is pleased because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, because of our yeah. faith in that righteousness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you think of this in a fatherly uh, connection and in, in, in say, my father will not love me unless I perform perfect. And we look at that in like humanistic form, we're like, hmm. okay, I think your, uh, your dad might need a little bit of help. He might need to like take it easy a little bit. And that's just kind of a human parable of, you know, we as fathers wouldn't base our love acceptance. We wouldn't base our, our care for, uh, upon the perfection of our children. Yet we put this off on God. And, and the reason why we do this is because of religion. Yes. All religions, I don't care who they are. They all have some concept uh, of this inside of them, which is really weird to me because everyone has kind of the concept of love also like the the golden rule like love your neighbor like you can find that inside of each religion but the reality of it is is that what makes christianity different is it, it, it communicates to us that we don't actually have the ability to do that right uh inside of the the nature of of insecurity and fear where all the other religions say, here's the expectation, go ahead and like rat race and try to keep up to it. And if you can, you know, uh, just like in the Quran, if you do this stuff, then, then you can find the, the mercy of Allah. But if you don't, then you can, you can expect him to whoop your ass. Um, you know, all, what's wrong with all the other systems is never really communicated to you that you actually didn't have the, the ability to do it, which I think um what the the law completely does in, yes. in, inside of uh christianity it leaves us in a state of reality that you know what i actually don't have the ability to love my neighbor as i ought because i am i'm fearful and i'm insecure and that causes me to focus on myself so i do uh things that are more in, in line with my self-interest um the bible sp spells that out clearly other yeah. religions give you the illusion that you could possibly pull this off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the amazing thing, going back to the Pharisees, I mean, I hate to pick on them, but they're a, they're a great example of this. Is it was like I said, it was all about appearance. The performance orientation was all about, but God, you know, He, he sees right through it. I mean, and and to their defense, sorta, uh, they had they had a, a doctrine that basically believed that if they all got it together and didn't sin, then the Messiah would come back. So that, that you know, they had a, they, they had a, a reason for wanting to do that. But, uh, yeah, that's what's so ironic is the further you get into a, what I call a works mentality or a legalistic is better, a legalistic mentality, the less you can, <laughs> the less you can really follow through it. And the further you get away from God, that's, that's yeah. what's so crazy. Now, 
I do want to go here, uh, switch gears a little bit because I think this is important. Is is we do want to say that you and I are not adverse to good works because sure. good good works are a part of this. Now, how do you, Tim, make a differentiation between somebody who's a illegalist versus somebody who is attempting through discipline to walk out the good works that are fit for repentance, so to speak? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, the best way that I, that I mark this out is the, it's, it's the cart before the horse mentality. And that is, so we, we understand by grace through faith and it's not of ourselves; It's a gift of God and not by works. Right. And then it goes on to the next verse that, uh, that God has ordained us for these good works. So the process is, is okay. I, uh, I, I get the offer of grace. I accept that grace by my, my my trust, my faith, and my reliance inside of him. And then from that place, I begin to, God begins to mold and shape my behavior and I have better outcomes and better fruit inside my life. So that's kind of the the organization there. In legalism, it's flipped the other way. And yeah. that is, if I could do the do the works, if I could, and, and sadly, and, and I feel bad about this, but there's there's some realms of the faith that still don't know if they are saved and they're kind of hoping so and you know they'll get to the pearly gates and and saint peter will will let you in sort of thing and it's like there's no assurance of salvation and the yeah. reason why it is is because it, the works is flipped on the other side to where his grace and his goodness and his favor is dependent on whether i perform well or not and so here's the the main detrimental thing with that is now i'm devoid of the power to produce any good works Yes, because it was literally by grace through faith, and then I step into this relationship where I'm empowered and energized by the Spirit of God. That all doesn't happen because I'm on. I, I put the cart before the horse, and I'm trying to produce good enough works to be accepted, loved, and approved by God. And then I find myself uh, not able to achieve that. So I'm still under legalism. You know, the image I had when you were saying cart before the horse, I, I see us in the, in the back of a cart pushing it with a horse up front or even in, in the back. <laughs> we're, we're, leading the, we're leading the horse and pushing the cart, and, and we're like, yeah, we're going by people where people are like, what an idiot, you know? He's, he's, he, he's, he's pushing, the, uh, pushing the cart, and the horse is still behind him, you know? And, and I, I think a lot of yeah. times we, we don't even see a lot of this in our own lives uh, I, I didn't for years, you know, see this, this expectation that I had. And a lot of that came from just growing up with parents and stuff, because our world operates in a merit-based, uh, uh, meritocracy, so to speak. So, so th this is totally different and we have to like divorce ourselves. We have to be in the world, but not of the world and come to an understanding that, that like I say all the time, number one, we can't live the Christian life. Only Jesus can live the Christian life through us. And the only way for us to be able to li let him live it through us is for us to take indirect means to, for him to be flowing in our life for us to walk it through. And I read something yeah. the other day I thought was really perfect. That this guy said, uh, he said, if you want to grow close and walk out what God has for you, then you grow closer to him. And out of that intimacy flows the work yeah. that you need to do. So and, and and that's why spiritual disciplines are so important. It's the they're the fulcrum, so to speak, that you indirectly lift up the rock instead of trying to pick up the rock yourself. And uh, yeah. they are work are working out in the gym. I mean, you work out in the gym to make yourself strong to be able to do other things. The working out in the gym is not what's going to get you the ability to do the other things. If that makes any sense, yeah, so, it does. It, you know, it's the difference between standing in power and not. Um, because if I'm like in a struggle to get something, I communicate to my mind that I don't actually have it. Right. And nobody actually goes and tries to get something that they, that they already have, unless you're kind of lost your marbles a little bit. But, uh, so if I go on that quest, I'm communicating that I, I don't have it. And so when really that in relation to God of, okay, you're, you're the light of the world. You, you are my son. Uh, you're a prince, you're a chosen generation, royal priesthood. Like this, all of this destiny of everything that says God says you are. And then not only that, which is go into everything that he says you have, 
Like we have the the Holy Spirit of God. We have peace with God. We have the grace of God. You know, we have this throne that we have access to, like all of that stuff. This is who you are. This is what you have. And what we're saying in legalism. Right now. I am not that. Right now. Uh, in legalism, I am not that. And I don't have that. And the reason why is because I'm not good enough. And that puts us in the realm of I deserve to be punished, whether we say it or not. Yeah. That's the reality of what it is, is yep. because I don't measure up, I deserve to be punished. And this is the reason why uh, we have human sacrifices. This is the reason why uh, people have been trying to appease deities for since we've been on this planet and uh, all the ritualistic stuff and everything that we go have going on is because I believe that this deity needs to be appeased and I'm not in good standing with that deity and uh, he's angry and he's frustrated with me. So I got to bring my gift. And these people were like, man, this gift is not enough. What do I do, man? I grab my son, let's go. Like, and they're taking their son and passing them through the fire. And this is all religiosity at, it, at its core to get something that, uh, that uh, we feel like we, we, we don't have. Yeah, and it leads to us like, it leads to us getting to this place, and, and, and I know you're going to laugh because you love it when I say this, but we, we, we try to shit all over ourselves, you know? I should do this, I should do that, you know? And, 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 but we do, and, and, and you can't live a peaceful, joyful life when you're too worried about shitting all over yourself. And the other thing, the other thing too, I want to bring in because you you opened up like a like like what for a wide receiver to walk right through there, the story that I think about that you just talked about and you alluded to is Abraham and Isaac, how Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain, he is willing to obey and do what God says, and because of his past experience in paganism, we have to remember that he was a pagan before God called him. And his past yeah. experience in paganism. He expected to get rid of his firstborn son, but then he still had faith that, you know, okay, I might kill him, but at least God will raise him from the dead. So he did have that. But but he goes up there, and he gets to the place to where he's ready to kill him, and God says, no, wait, I will provide a sacrifice. And, and people will take that with our legalism mindsets and say, see, God was testing him. God was testing him to make sure that he had the should to be able to do what he did. When in reality, and I don't remember where I heard this somewhere before, I, but, but it's so true. It was all a theater. It was all a picture. He was trying to create a yeah. picture that he is not like the pagan gods. He is not going to require your firstborn. He is the one that's going to provide the sacrifice for us. We yeah. don't have to work at it. And, and people miss that in that whole section of scripture they don't understand that that's what yahweh was trying to show to abraham was that he's different he is holy yeah you know ho holiness is yeah. more about the diff being different than it is about performance we we get that all confused and uh yeah we that, do. that that story just to me really just pops out that that's the kind of father we serve a father that's going to provide it for us and he does it with his son he provides the ultimate sacrifice yeah, yeah. for us Man, I love that. And when I when I got that revelation, um, you know, it wasn't inside of the the legalistic system. It was uh, it was outside of it, and it's a shame. Um, yeah. But once I got the the concept behind that, um, that radically changed. I want to talk about the shoulds though, because the, <laughs> you know, we have this uh, uh, moral uh, expectation, and you know, I'd be amiss to say that the Bible doesn't say what you should do. Um, it actually used the word should quite a bit. And it also uses the word ought. Um, you ought. Um, by this time, yeah. you ought to be teachers of the law. You know, there's there's quite a few oughts and shoulds in the Bible. And the way that I've reconciled those uh, things is, is through the other scriptures that say, I'm going to create and make you what you ought to be. Um, and so the oughtness comes through the, the formation of the spirit of God inside of our lives. And it correlates to that change in the transformation of the heart that I will cause yeah. you this causation to walk in my ways. Um, and so this, this power originates, uh, from God himself. Now, if we don't have that, 
what we have is a show. And this is one of the things that the Pharisees got busted for. And it's like, if I present myself well on the outside, uh, external, uh, conforming to certain things, customs, rituals, washings, uh, days, time, seasons, you know, if I conform to this, then I have this outward show of conformity to this. And that's what makes me righteous. And then he calls them whitewashed tombs, right? They're beautiful on the outside. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but they're dead on the inside. So when it, when we have the, uh, topic of religiosity, I would say that that's exactly what religiosity looks like is that I'm going to conform exteriorly on the outside. Um, and that's gonna cause me to be righteous where the message of, of faith and faith righteousness says, man, if we, we take care of the inside, uh, that is like matters of the heart because from the heart proceeds all of these things. If, if we do, if the great surgeon can come do his operation in there, then your that's where that's where holiness comes from. That's where goodness comes from, and um, then the outside will begin to change. So the differentiator would be heart work that transforms into behavior, or outside work that deems you as righteous. And those would be kind of the two differentiators for me. Yeah, and and two I've noticed it in my work with addicts and in recovery, and just with discipling people in general, I've noticed that the Holy Spirit, he is, is the best, what's the word, um, convictor and dealer with the shoulds that, that anybody else. Uh, for example, I remember early on, uh, we had a couple, a uh, church I was an associate at and, and they lived together. And, you know, er, you know every, all, all the religious spirits in the thing, like, oh, we need to tell them, you know, we need to, and I'm like, no. Let's love them. Let's let the Holy Spirit do his work. And the Holy Spirit did his work, and they moved out, they got married, and then they, they moved back in. They did the right thing. They were living together, and they, they did the right thing. Now, a lot of uh, legalistic holiness people would say, oh, you know, whatever. But see, I, I don't think, I think the Holy Spirit got to the root of what it is and, and, and showed them, and it, it was a conviction. It wasn't, other people from the outside forcing them with their their standards or their religiosity to do that kind of thing. I mean, they just woke up one day and realized, you know, I, hey, I, I don't think we're doing what's right. I, I don't think we're supposed to cohabitate like that. Yeah, and 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 so it, and and holiness will take care of itself if we take care of the intimacy with God. Yeah, that's the 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 cart for the horse. We, if we pursue intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's like it will naturally begin to flow out of our lives because we get we take care of all the stuff that's in our soul. When I say this all the time, our, our souls, when we're born again, are like World War One battlefields. They have trenches and, and barbed wire and and stuff yeah. everywhere. And and what God has deposited inside our spirit has got to flow through there and wash all that away. Yeah, and it'll manifest in our bodies and in our relationships. And that's just yeah. so crucial. But we get it, we get it all out of whack. We we want to perform. And, and and I'm not saying there's not like like I said, there's not I'm not saying there's not a place for us to do actions. Like I always say, Dallas Willard says this, God is not adverse to effort, he's adverse to merit. Sure. You know, we do need to put forth effort. We do need to read the Bible, but you read the Bible differently when it's a loving father than you do if it's a hard taskmaster. Just ask the Jews. Sure. I mean, I'm being honest, and, and I don't mean that like all Jews, but but just ask the the the, the Talmudic, uh, Pharisaical type Jews that have been carried on down through the years. Uh, he's so holy and out there that there's no relationship with him. And if you read in early parts of Genesis, they all had an intimate relationship with the Father. And I, yeah. and I think, and I think even with uh, the Son of God before he, his pre-incarnate, it, it, it comes from that intimacy. We have to get back to that intimacy. So, so let me ask you this: If, if you were going to give a prescription for somebody since you've come out of it, uh, of how? how to gravitate from legalism, like, you know, one, two, three, four, so to speak, out of legalism into, what's, what's a good word for this, Tim? Uh, into grace, into, sure. 
it's a relational legalism yeah. versus relational relationship. What 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 would be some advice or some steps that you would give them to uh, get out of this? Sure, sure. So, yeah, this might come first in the some mindsets to drop, but with the mindset to drop is the flip side of that mindset. So, what you talked about uh, merit is if we can't get beyond this one, I don't think we're going to go very much further. And that is. Uh, when I think of merit, I think of like merit badges and merit badges are given to, to those who accomplish the, the task. Right. And so you would get dubbed worthy by, by, by completing whatever it is. And, you know, here's your, here's your merit badge. So first is, is the concept of sal- salvation. And this is kind of an old song, but we don't get saved by merit badges. And what that correlates to is that I'm, I'm going to stop the religious struggle of trying and I'm going to start relying on him. And the reason why this is so important is, is are we going to meet our maker with entitlement of saying, give me what I deserve because I did da, 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 give me what I deserve. And then to find out that we deserve something quite different, that would be a terrible, terrible experience, right? Or are we going to enter into our creator with this sense of gratitude for everything that he has bestowed upon us and he's given us, right? And so you got these two frames. Am I going to show up entitled? Am I going to show up grateful? And this manifests actually throughout our life also. We've got a lot of entitled, spoiled children out there, or we've got those who are, are living from a, a place of power and gratitude. So I think merit, merit has to be uh, the beginning conversation. And this is kind of a weird thing, but it, stop trying and start relying. And That's good. Yeah. The the concept is is okay. If I'm going to receive by by grace through faith the benefits of uh, of the salvation of everything that I have in God, then I'm going to stop trying to earn that myself, and I'm going to rely on what He did uh, to accomplish that. It seems sim- simplistic. Um, but people, when they, when they come to the faith, they're given a different message than this. They are yeah. not given the message of trust, reliance upon Christ. Um, it's very, it's, it's very watered down. So you would think somebody would, would know that they're, 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 they're going to stop trying in the religious struggle and start relying, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those, those two would be the, uh, some of the biggest that that come out but after that would be um is a belief that is right conduct does that go first or does right heart and spirit go first and so which is the cause that produces the the effect is is perfect conduct going to give me a righteous heart or being made righteous in him going to work out and be better conduct. And so the difference between these is, am I going to walk in faith righteousness or works righteousness? Right. And if you read all Paul's stuff, he's trying to give us a, a righteousness that's apart from the law. And that's like, you show legalists this and they just dance around. They, they, just, whoop, 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 and they just want to prove their couple of scriptures that prove their point. Yeah, but when it comes back to Paul said that I am prescribing here a righteousness that is apart from the law, and that's basically aside from merit, and this is the stumbling stone. This is the the yep. message that causes people to turn away. You can tell them God loves you all you want. There's no offense to that. I ain't got no problem with that. You tell them faith righteousness or works righteousness or self righteousness versus God's righteousness, and now all of a sudden, you know, we we have some stumbling, we have some issues, and so this is why it's important we're having this conversation because it's a fundamental core issue. If you don't get this one right, you will not live right. No, you're right. You'll be entitled. You'll be self-righteous. You'll be a hypocrite. You'll be external uh, performances. You just won't live right. Yeah, yeah, identical. I mean, totally. And, and and here's the other thing that I want to slide into to 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 kind of finish off our 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 talk here is once you get the faith righteousness done, 
once you realize that you are connected to God, to, to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by love, that means when you begin to walk out these things, which we call obedient allegiance, which I think is super important in the kingdom. I mean, we need to bring that out, and we need to talk about that for a minute. But when you have that love basis there, it becomes like, this is another image that I have, it becomes like a father teaching a child how to ride a bike. If a child gets on the bike, and they, they tump over, I don't know where we get the word tump, that's a weird word, anyway. It tumps over, all right, and it, it, the father doesn't sit there and say, uh, that's it. I'm done with you. You're going to hell because you fell over on the bike. I, your heart is not right. It is desperately wicked because you fell over on that bike. No, a loving father is going to go over there and say, yeah, because they have that relationship, that that relationship is, is taken care of. It's rock solid. He will go over there and pick him up, dust him off, put him back on the thing and say, let's try this again. Yeah. And, 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 and to me in my life, it, it it's translated into it. It took, you know, a, a dark night of the soul for me to get this place. It's translated into a, a, like there used to be an old Christian song back in the, in the nineties. It's like, you fall down and we get up, we fall down and we get up. Oh yeah. I remember and, that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it and, was and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's so amazing about it is I got a prophetic word 20 some years ago about that being a, an, an issue in my life. And it has been an issue in my life that when I fall down, I get back up. But if, but if I, if I don't have a father that loves me, that wants me to get back up and put me back on the bike, I'm not going to get back up because I'm going to cower in fear and pun and, and be afraid of punishment. And yeah. if we, if we begin to see God is using the real word for discipline, which is to train, train you know, yeah. like a personal trainer, he becomes our yeah. coach our personal trainer to get us to walk like Jesus. And he provides the Holy spirit to do this. We, we won't be so hard on ourselves when we screw up. It, it's like, I don't know how people live without grace because when you screw up, there's nothing but condemnation, shame, and guilt. Yeah. When there, there's grace, you could just, you know, and, and I, I joke and I've told you this when I commit a sin, it's, it's almost like the religiosity pops up and it's like, I have to give it at least a, a, uh, a certain amount of time before I confess it because, you know, it's just too good for me to confess my sin right after I've committed it. I haven't paid enough penance or, yeah. or I haven't paid enough whatever, whatever it's called to, you know, and, and that's so absurd. Reality is, is, is when I fall off that bike, I need to run to the father and let him take care of my wounds and put me back on that bike. Cause that's, yeah, what, he's, yeah. that's what he's after is he's after us being obedient allegiance. And we do that when we have the foundation of relationship and connection with him dealt with yeah. and done. And done. That's so good. Yeah. That's so good, man. I, uh, you, you had a couple of thoughts coming to my mind, but one is the legalists always, you know, say that they, they're, they're doing it by the book. Right. And in reality, like they're not doing really anything by the book. Uh, in the sense of modeling Jesus Christ and his ministry and mentorship and all that stuff. They're not doing anything by the book, but they claim to be doing it by the book. Right. But it literally says that the under legalism, that they did not submit themselves to the righteousness or God's way in making men righteous with himself. And so when we're under legalism, we're actually not doing it by the book because the core message is, is where righteousness comes from. And so just that fundamental uh, belief in, in, in shift that you can do some things by, by the book, but this one, this one is like uh, a serious one that we need to really, really focus on. But I did want to, um, you know, finish with this thought of the, the cycle of trying. And that's if I don't have what God wants to give me, and I'm in a struggle to earn it. It's kind of like dangling a carrot. And, um, yes, yes. And so you can look at the perceived benefit. Oh, I can have, have peace with God. I can have power with God or he can love me or whatever. And it's seen at a distance in, in the carrots dangled. And so that gets you into a, a rat race in a sense of I'm going to endeavor to, to get the carrot. 
And what that leads to is an expectation, right? So whatever it is that you put on yourself, this expectation will get me this. If I meet this, and here's the reality of it, that we, we set after to do that thing. And there's weak moments in life where we fail and fall short, right? And what happens, especially with addicts that I've noticed, is they repeat this cycle so much that the prolonged period between failure and get back up gets lengthened longer and longer and longer where, you know, initial relapse or something could be one day and the next day I'm getting back on the horse, man, I shouldn't have done that. And then this progressed longer and longer and longer and longer. And the reason why it's so important to bust that cycle is because a lot of people don't make it back, man. Uh, they relapse and, and they don't make it back. They're doing hardcore drugs and, and stuff. And it's like, we need to really break that cycle of trying. That way we can come to the throne of grace instead of run away immediately. And then these overdoses wouldn't be happening. This roller coaster Christianity, man, I spent like lots of condemnation. After I messed up, like I would beat myself up. I feel disconnected with God. It sent me into a spiral of shame. I would uh, be in a mental state where, where I was like, I was probably going a little bit cuckoo, like for real, yeah. beating myself up in the shame. So yeah. this would be better for our mental health. It'll be better for sobriety. It'd be better in so many ways. Uh, well, just stop doing this. <laughs> and I almost want, I almost wonder if the whole giving coins out promotes that. That whole, I mean, yeah. and I'm not knocking that. I, I, I get the reward of that and the being able to so, so called brag on yourself in a positive, godly way that, hey, this is a victory. I need to celebrate it. However, you know, you get too many, you get, like you said, you get too far out there with the coins. When, when you, if you go three years and, and have it and you have a relapse, you're going to be like, well, there's no hope for me. If I can't, yeah. if, if I can't do it after three years, if I did it two days after I, I got on the horse, well, that's, that's expected. But if I've yeah. gone three years and I relapse, you know, you're right. It, it, it'll spiral you into, and that's because of that performance orientation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. And uh, there, there's some there's some good resources out there for any of you in my audience that, are, that deal with addictions and, and recovery. Uh, they come from uh, a guy named Neil Anderson, where he teaches you more yeah. about your your identity, and that is what's going to free you from this. You are not a, yeah. you're not an addict that has a coin and it hasn't used in three years. You are a, a child of God, and if well, you begin to see yourself and 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 imprint that into you the the truth about yourself it's not a legal fiction it's not just something we just say you know but god sees us that way it is legitimately ontologically yeah. the truth you are a new creation in your spirit you don't have some Man. other heart that's like whichever one you feed i'm gonna feed the good dog and not the bad dog you know that that's not biblical that's that's religion honestly is what it is and so yeah what's crazy about that yeah brandon is so the it, you know i find this more in, mostly in the reform cases but you know holding on to worm theology and grabbing the couple scriptures where where paul said i'm the chief of all sinners and right and they grab a hold of these couple ones that really basically their their institution tells them to keep them in their place and their place is as yep. a subjected servant to the system and yep. so it's good for slavery. It's amazing for slavery. And so they keep them enslaved to this mentality. If you offer a perspective, like we're offering of, hey, you're part of a royal priesthood, like your, your destiny, you're connected to God. You have a place at his table, like let's, let's rule and reign in, in this, in this world. And you start offering a different perspective. Immediately you get resistance and they go back to the humble worm uh, thing because they're scared that they're going to be elevated in pride. They're scared that the crab's going to get out of the bucket and it's just going to be unmanageable. And it, 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 uh, it stops them from really believing. But here's the point I wanted to make is they somehow think that that's being humble. And so God tells you like all of these things and he tells you all of this stuff that you have, but you say, no, I don't have that. And you think that that's being humble. And I just, I just find that to be 
uh, something very weird that we would disregard everything that we say and call that humility. I call that pride. Yeah, false humility is pride, and it's a lie. It's, it's a lie. You are, you know, God is telling you the truth, and you're saying He's a liar. No, yeah, I don't believe it. Yep. No. Nope. Yep. It's crazy. So t- talk talk a little bit more, and we'll wrap this up. But talk a little bit more about you've you've coined this word. I think you've coined it. I haven't heard it anywhere else. But obedient allegiance. Tell us about that and how this fits into legalism and grace. Sure. So. Uh, allegiance has to do with faith, trust, deposit, and so basically, faith is a is a uh, it's it's a money term, it's a lending term. You know, they call it good faith deposit. And basically, what you're saying is, I'm going to take this and I'm going to entrust this inside of the care of another person, right? And so that's where we get the concept of faith. I make my deposit, and so when we talk about it with God, it was the same with Yahweh. Is that that our allegiance is to him and that I'm making my deposit with him inside of gang circles. That would be, I'm rolling with this gang inside of marriage would be, I'm rolling with this lady. Um, so all of this concepts, a allegiance, like this is, this is where my devotion is coming to. And from that comes a sense of obedience. And that is by faith, Abraham obeyed. And so this is actually what real faith looks like because there is no concept of, of, of a trust and faith than a reliance upon God that doesn't begin to yield to it. So that's where yeah. I came up with obedient allegiance that faith produces actions and behaviors, but it's, it's the faith that initiates that process. And it's not the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I and mean, then that's what I love about that. I know we toyed with the, you know, which way to do it, but it's better. The allegiance is better as a noun because it, yeah. It, 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 yeah. And the, the obedience is better as a descriptor, an adjective of that noun. And it reminds me of what, what we've talked about before, how God is not loving holiness as much as he is holy love. And yeah, a, a lot of people see that as a play on words or whatever, but it's, it's really not a play. On, it makes, it's, there's a, there's a total difference between, you know, yes. l- loving holiness because holiness is the, you know, versus holy love and then holy being the descriptor of the love being the main thing. And I see that the same way with the obedient allegiance. The, the faith is the main thing. That is where we put we put our allegiance. Like, I, I, I love the fact you brought up gangs and and groups. And, and that's why a lot of secret societies are so bad, because they put their allegiance more with a secret society than they do their religion. Yeah. Um, that they're a part of, whether it be Islam, Judaism, or Christianity. And uh, so, yeah, but obedient allegiance is a great term, and, and I love, I'm using it all the time now, and I think we need to get it out there because it it succinctly identifies what we're after in the Christian yeah. life. And yeah. that obedience goes less about me sinning and more about me of hearing God and, and, and obeying, hearing God, trusting, and obeying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's concepts of belief as like mental assents to creeds and stuff. And that would be more of a religiosity's mindset. If you assent to these certain creeds, then you're, then you're in where the, the message of faith is, is one of, uh, science and allegiance. And, um, and from that place of allegiance, uh, you stand in a place of power that actually causes you to obey. And so we talked about this before. Would Abraham say he had faith? If he believed God, but didn't go out, not knowing where he was going, like, no. Or if Moses, it said Moses had great faith that he refused to be called the the son of Pharaoh's daughter, right? But he didn't choose to suffer with the people of God. Like, no, we wouldn't be talking about his faith because it wouldn't, it would be genuine faith. It would be just. Well, allegiance is such a powerful term because with allegiance comes a heartfelt devotion it involves our feels too, which is really important. Even though we make an intention, f- true faith is an intention, but then after the intention comes our emotions, they come after that. And uh, an allegiance is something we're willing to die for. You know, you could say you have faith in God all day long, but if you don't have an allegiance to him, you're not willing to put down your life for. I mean, you know, I, I don't do it anymore, but when we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, we're basically saying, I would die for this flag, for this country. 
And a lot of people didn't realize that when we were in elementary school and they made us say, say that, you know, that we were given allegiance to something else. And, and even back in the Roman times, they gave allegiance to Caesar. So that was the power of what the, the term allegiance means. And yeah. it, it's faith in action. It's, it's faith that's, that's a, it's a mode of faith and it leads to obedience. So, yeah. Yep. It's good, brother. I love it. Well, cool. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? I encourage the listeners to, to really uh, hammer out this issue. Uh, it's fundamental. I would leave with the scripture, those that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. So it's not enough uh, just to receive the grace, you know, uh, step into the gift of righteousness that he has for you and you will begin to reign as princes, as kings, as princesses with God in your royal identity and everything that he has available for you. Do you know what the address for that scripture is? Do you know what it is? It's it's Romans, uh, I believe, three or four. Three or four. Somewhere right. in there. Yeah, yeah, probably four. Yeah. So you guys check that out. And thank you, Tim, for coming on here and us just uh, talking about a topic that's really in my heart right now and it's in years too since you're writing a book and and designing a course about it and we really need to set christians free and in our avenue set men free because men are really bound and yeah and 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 uh you know just having an understanding of faith righteousness and faith and and legalism and all that stuff will really help them get free so thank you and we'll put in the show notes different ways you can get a hold of tim through band of brothers and and some of his other things he does he helps train podcasters and even has a, a bonus plan where he'll actually do everything for you so we'll put all that in the show notes and once again tim thank you for being on the show man i appreciate it thank you brother man i appreciate it Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.